Uh, well, just do I just uh, sure. ramble a little bit? Just you throw in a. Anytime I want to prod you, I okay. will. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Well, I came to Washington. I was up. At uh, well, just do I just uh, sure. ramble a little bit? Just you ramble. throw in a. Anytime I want to prod you, I okay. will. Okay. Okay, that's easy. fine. Well, I came to Washington. I was up in New York with the Old Life magazine for a couple of years, but I came down to Washington in 1957 with Life magazine. I switched over to Time in 1958, and that was really kind of the heyday of of uh, the majority leader, Lyndon B. Johnson. And he was a far greater figure in town than perhaps uh, we realize today because Ike was kind of somnolent over there in the White House. He'd had, uh, look, let's face it, he'd had a heart attack, he'd uh, had ileitis, he was ill. He was kind of a fading star, not that he didn't have power, he was a, he was a very great uh, influence, but it, it, he just, that wasn't Ike's style. And Johnson was this flamboyant, uh, really driving uh, a genius at legislation up on the hill. And we all knew that, and I went up at first with Life magazine to just talk about him, and, uh, and then later with Time. And of course, Johnson, being the, uh, such a wonderful, cunning animal in this political jungle, instantly knew when a Time and Life man <laughs> arrived because they were important to him. And he told me one time uh, later on, he said, Hugh, he said, I'd rather have one paragraph in Time magazine than a whole column in any place else. Now, you know, that with a lot of that was Johnson exaggeration, but there was some truth to that. We were, <clears throat> Time was really, Time Life, the only global uh, the media at that time. Radio hadn't penetrated, uh, I guess you might say National Geographic, but no, news media. We, we really kind of blanketed the world to, to the extent it was in those days. And uh, so Johnson understood the importance of the Kennedy. John Kennedy told me, he said, I go around this world and he said, I hit all these embassies. He said, the first thing the ambassador does is say, I was reading in Time Magazine, such and such a thing. And he said, I, it's just unbelievable. So I've got to deal with you guys. <laughs> it's what it is. Well, LBJ, what a figure he was. And I remember I went up there and uh, to the the to the uh, the magazine gallery, which in those days uh, was on the floor with his office. It was a, the gallery floor, and the majority leader's office was just down the hall in the corner. And between the uh, magazine gallery, periodical gallery, it's called, and uh, his Johnson was his staff, and it included George Reedy and Harry McPherson was in there, and Jerry Siegel, and and uh, some of the old Johnson troops, and and also we had Willie Day Taylor was in there. I can't remember was whether Ashton Thornhill was in then, but also uh, uh, Grace Tully, who had come from FDR's uh, administration, and is, it figures rather prominently in the history. Well, I was awed number one by the staff. I, you know, they were famous people, and, and delightful people, I have to say. Uh, and then, and then. Uh, well, with life, of course, we did some picture stories, but I didn't get into it. It wasn't until I was made uh, the political correspondent in 58 and the Hill one of the Hill correspondents where Johnson really took an interest in me and he gave me the treatment. Now, this was the initiation of anybody who came into his orbit. And I, rem <laughs> I remember George Reed, he said, uh, he said, the leader would like to see you, and we went down the hall. And the, the, that's before the thorn room, throne room, that big office that Johnson uh, prepared for himself. This was just a normal kind of office down the corner, nice view down the mall and all in that. Johnson behind his desk, an impressive figure, I remember from the very start. Uh, uh, he was quite slender then, and tall. This was after his heart attack and he'd lost weight and, and he was uh, sitting behind the desk. And I wish I'd, I'd, I'd wish I'd had a tape recorder in those old days. Number, number one, he talked about the magazine. He talked about, he knew the editors some, and he knew the, how, he, how he liked to read the magazine. And uh, it wasn't that time, but later on when, uh, 
uh, when I was there, where he called up one of the editors to tell him what a great man I was. Now, he did that with everybody. Russell Baker tells that story, too. And I, and I think all of the people like that that came in got that treatment. But I, I, I was dazzled by it, I have to admit. And, I, and I, as I look back on it, there was a lot that was just Johnson, hyperbole, the old Texas stories. But there was a lot <clears throat> that was real. He talked about the meaning of the country. He talked about his upbringing. How about, he talked about seeing the people on the Perdinalis grow old before their time because things were so hard. He thought government was the, the way to help people, and that's why he was in it. And, he, and he, he was a little snide now and then about the banker's house up on the hill, the big white house up there. And, uh, and uh, it talked about Lady Bird, and he talked about being down there and his campaigns. It was a story somewhat of Johnson's life, but it was, it was really quite wonderful. Uh, and then about the Senate and uh, what he was trying to do. And, uh, it, you know, it was inspiring. Now, there were a few little side things that uh, I had to chuckle about later on because he's talking about how he wasn't interested. To, he was interested in the people's business. He was interested in making this country great. He was interested in these principles. He didn't care about money. <laughs> well, <laughs> that wasn't exactly true. <laughs> he said, I got this shirt here. Yeah, at $5, I probably paid for it. Nothing, nothing, you know, $5. He said, I don't have anything else. I don't have any other anything. Money doesn't matter to me. Well, as we know, he, his, his television station was turning into a gold mine down there. And, and, it, and as I looked around on the desk, there were gold things all over. You know, he had a wonderful gold wristwatch and gold cufflinks. And there were the, 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 the desk set was all gold and that. And, and I, but I, it didn't bother me then. It, didn't, it, it didn't, didn't mean much to me. And I remember I went out and I wrote a memo to New York about that episode and, and basically it emphasized this fellow of where he'd come from and what he was all about and how he wanted this nation to run and the flag, he always talked about the flag up there he had that little poem you know but that he did when he was a schoolboy about my, that's the most wonderful thing these old eyes have seen is that flag flying up there and i wrote all of that and then i just happened to throw in a paragraph or two about all the gold <laughs> and about johnson well as you might know, in Time Magazine, they used the stuff about the gold. <laughs> and I was summoned back to the office very shortly thereafter about where did I get all this and how did that all happen. And Johnson was very unhappy with me, but he was still a little wary. We didn't, uh, he, didn't, uh, he didn't take me on. At some point in there, though, uh, I can't remember. It must have been before. I had the treatment where I was just introduced in the hall. You know, he clapped me in those big iron, you know, and he introduced me as Hugh Sidey, Time Magazine. He said, he said, never knew a reporter without a character flaw. What's yours? <laughs> At some point in there. But anyway, I got the treatment. And I must say, I loved it. I was just intrigued with this man. He's the single most fascinating human being I'd ever met, and still remains. Uh, you know, just volcanic in his passions and, and, and yet a streak of genius about how to run that place that I'd never seen or never seen since. Uh, an understanding of people that seemed like almost like osmosis where he'd come up to you and he could kind of calculate you. And as Johnson later said, see you and smell you and feel you and hear you, all those things. So I immediately uh, he got into the swing of things up there, but realized also that, uh, particularly for my kind of journalism, I had to deal with Johnson. So I, I told him, I said, well, I hope that I can talk to you. Well, as it turned out, Johnson knew my writing habits and deadlines. And so Johnson set aside a little time for me every Thursday. That's when I wrote. He, he knew I was filing. And, it, and both up in that old office building, and then, then he redid the room, redid it, and he put in this really rather elegant office down below, just off the floor of the Senate. This other one was up in the gallery level. I don't know what that office was down there, but he took it over. And you know, that was another kind of explosion because we all wrote pieces about, uh, about the throne room 
it was it was Deb. Fortunately, I was not alone on that. But he chewed me out about that. What do you mean? You know, why can't I? Why can't your majority leader have a decent office? You know, well, they were these lights that were shining down on him, and he had a telephone that must have had 50 buttons on it. You know, and he had uh, and his secretary was over in the corner, and he had a washroom, and he had everything going there. It was uh, it was uh, it was something. As I look back on it, not that big. Uh, not that great a deal, but it was new up there. At, uh, so, so we wrote about that. But uh, anyway, at, he he knew the rhythm that I would write, and he'd leave a little time for me. And when I wouldn't come around, he he upbraid me about it. Where you been? Where you been? You know, I want to talk to you. You know that that was a theme through his whole life. You come to me. You get it from me. Now. Naturally, he wanted to give it a spin, of course, and, but you know, any, any good reporter would understand that. And my theory about reporting was always that those guys, powerful people, presidents, majority leaders, had a right to tell their story. Now, we had a right, if we decided it was wrong or they were, weren't telling the truth, to point that out, but that they had that right. And so I, you know, at least at first got along pretty good with Johnson because I, he'd tell me about how he managed bills, how he dealt with certain people, and, uh, and uh, I would write it, get in the magazine a lot of it. So we had a good, good relationship. Johnson could see, see some product come out of the other, the other end. But it, it, it was a wonderful time in the Senate. And Johnson and Rayburn, who was then the speaker, were far more powerful than than the equivalents are today in in Washington. Again, it was because Eisenhower had kind of receded from view uh, uh, somewhat. He was kind of his his term was running down. Uh, I can't recall whether Bob Taft was sick by then. Probably may have even been dead by then. There was no no uh, Republican that. Uh, could really had the stature of Taft that took over. In fact, I remember uh, Bill Nolan was a minority leader when I first went up there, and I went in to uh, one time to to talk to Johnson, and he said, "You know, I just love Bill Nolan. He said uh, just just wonderful having him as." As minority leader, and I, it you know, just didn't quite sound like Johnson. I kind of he looked quizzical about it, and then he leaned over and said, "Because he's a goddamn dumb." <laughs> And I said, oh, he said, I can beat him every time. You know? He never figures it out till it's too late. <laughs> so so uh, I, I, that was Johnson. Always a surprise kind of move here and there. And, and I remember along those lines, Bill Nolan <clears throat> beat him on something or got a bill, got, got something that he wasn't supposed to by our count. And... Uh, I went and said, "Mr. Leader, what's uh, what happened?" He said, "And this is this is why Johnson is just so wise about these things." John said, "Hugh, you don't want to win them all." He said, "If you win them all, or you think you want to, pretty soon you're going to be losing them all." And he just just gives 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 something to these other people, including Bill Nolan, I guess. Uh, but I, you know, I used to hover around that office because he'd, he'd sometimes I'd run into him, he'd grab me and pull me in there. Johnson liked to play big dog. He liked to show you how important it was. I, it made me very uncomfortable sometimes. He'd put me in, and he'd start to go through his mail, and he'd hand me the letter. You know, from somebody, and I'd, I'd read it, but I, you know, I really didn't want to know. But uh, that was just him. He'd kind of sweep you into the orbit at that time. And uh, I remember when I, when they opened the new office. I think one of the first times I went in, and it had a little hall. You came in, and then the office was off to the side. And when I came in, Johnson had this. I, I think it was a life size photograph of himself down at the end, which, you know, you got in and there, Johnson. And there was a desk in front for receptionist. Here's this, here's this, this nice looking young man. I couldn't have been, I, I figured, you know, about 18 or 19. And I went up to, to introduce myself and, and I said, I'm Hugh Sidey. And he said, I'm Billy Don Moyers. And that's the first time I met 
Bill Moyers. He was outside the reception. We got to know each other, talked about it. He was living in Johnson's basement at that time. He was a young aide, and he went on to all his, uh, his great fame and, and achievement. But I would hang around there, and I would uh, I'd go in and see him every Thursday night, and they were sometimes wild sessions. I remember, and you see, that was the day also when uh, Johnson would go down to the, uh, for the leadership meeting, and he'd meet Ike, and they'd talk about the bills. And that space was very big then. I, again, I'd mentioned earlier about how Rayburn and Johnson were larger than life. They were really, in many weeks, months back then, the preeminent political figures in America. They were the ones that, that commented on space and the Cold War and the Soviet Union, you know, and their word was powerful because of appropriations, the money, but also you know, particularly in the space race, Johnson had moved in there after Sputnik and really made that kind of his baby and moved moved ahead so, and, and, and on in the defense appropriations and that that was the time as you uh, remember when uh, we were de the, the missile we were developing the missiles and the nuclear submarines and that whole thing Congress very much involved with all of that and Johnson right at the forefront so uh, you know you really wanted to know how things would go you needed to plug in with those fellows and Johnson of course used it to the hilt but uh, those Thursday nights were crazy. I mean, you know, if something he didn't like in the magazine, why well, he would, uh, oh, he just raised Camey. Where did you get that, you know? Now you come to talk to me, that's just crazy. And I remember once he was, he was we were in the, in the office there and he, we were, uh, uh, we were, uh, I, don't, I don't know what, it, what I'd done or something the magazine had done, but anyway, anyway, he, uh, he was changing shirts. He was going out to some formal dinner, and he, you know, old Johnson there, that big body of his, and he was stripped down, and he was washing himself with the washcloth all over, and he's chewing me out all the time. And I kind of was, I was standing because I, because he was over in the washcloth, and he started to stalk me around the table. And I'd move around this table. He had to kind of get out of the way, you know, because how he thrust his nose right down on your nose. <laughs> I'd say, yes, Mr. President, no, no, Mr. Mr. Leader, no, no, no. Ah, sight of you're nothing but a whore for the Republican Party. That's all you are, working for Time Magazine or goddamn Republican. <laughs> no, I said, Mr. President, I'm a registered Democrat. I've been all my life. Ah, that doesn't matter. <laughs> You know, and around and around we went with this, you know, him swabbing himself with the with the white cloth. <laughs> they were they were some nights. I was in there in a very sad night too. Uh, and here again, it was a little uncomfortable when he swept me in. It was the night that they got the word that uh, John Connolly's daughter had been killed. The the daughter, as I remembered, had run off. Uh, they, uh, with a boyfriend, and they were in a motel. And the story was that he, they, he was he was cleaning the gun, and it went off and killed her. And I was sitting there. We were talking about something, and the phone call came. And Johnson, uh, and I must say, Johnson never panicked. He just said, "Oh, oh, oh." And then about that time, Lady, Lady Bird burst in. She was there. The kids were there, and. Uh, and he called up Conley, and she talked to Nellie, and it was all there. And I tried several times. I tried to get up and leave. Johnson wouldn't have it. Said, no, you stay right there. You stay right there. Unbelievable kind of scene. But this Johnson that just again kind of possessed you, kept you, kept you in there. Uh, there were many times that, uh, as the campaign heated up to. Uh, people to be in there. I'd be in there talking to him. He'd have him come in. Dick Russell, for instance. I, I was in awe of uh, Senator Russell from Georgia. Uh, but I'd be there, and Senator Russell would come in, sit down, and kind of nod to me, and they'd conduct a little business job, which told me, you know, there's so much written about how Russell created Johnson, and I think that's true in many ways. But also, at that point, Johnson was the dominant figure. There's just no question. I mean, I, you know, I, I, you'd have thought out of respect for the old gentleman. He just said, "All right, you uh, come back and look." No, he just stay right there, as if what he said to Russell wasn't going to be too important. <laughs> you know, so you got the feel. And then there were a lot of wonderful things. Uh, 
back as the campaign came out. Kennedy came in one night and when the campaign was charging up and Johnson was in there and, and as you know Kennedy was very much involved in the labor reform Taft-Hartley Act. He was one of the floor managers for it. Bobby Kennedy had been on the rackets hearings that brought all that out that really created that bill in many ways and uh, I remember Kennedy came in and Hoffa had attacked John Kennedy uh, in the paper. I forget what the charge was but he attacked him and uh, and uh, Kennedy came in for something to, <clears throat> and, and Johnson said, well, I, Senator, how'd you get that done? He said, that guy's the best campaigner you got. How'd you get Hoffa to attack you? He said, he said that's better than have your mother out there, isn't it? <laughs> Kennedy broke up, you know. He said, yeah, he said, any time I could get one of those guys to take me on, <laughs> it, it helps. Johnson went on and on and laughed all about it. I never... Johnson's, Johnson was the funniest man to be with. Your sides would ache after an hour or two with him. And yet, I, I don't think he had a sense of humor in the classic sense. He couldn't laugh at himself. It was just a little too serious, but, but honest to goodness, with other people, it, 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 he just had this wry way uh, of, uh, of dealing with him. I, uh, and I love to watch him on the floor. You know, he had those mohair suits. I don't know where he got those things, but you know, they were kind of glistening. They were bright, hard, shiny finish. And a bow tie like mine. I kind of wore my bow tie in commemoration of old LBJ, because he and I used to wear bow ties back there. And he had a Vix inhaler. I, he had that thing, he, and he was had it up his nose, you know, getting, <laughs> I guess it made him be able to talk more. But he had his papers down there. I used to watch him. And he, and he, and he had these gestures to, you know, to speed up the vote count, to slow down the vote count, so and so, so and so, go out the back door into the cloakroom. I, he was just, uh, he, he was just superb. I mean, it was his w universe, and he knew everything. Not a sparrow fell that he didn't. Bobby Baker would come in, you know, whisper in his ear, out he'd go, and and uh, it was just marvelous. And Johnson would look up at me every now and then, wink, you know, if, if we're doing a story. And uh, uh, I, I don't know, I, I, uh, I admired the technique. And I also felt secure. I, uh, there was just a quality about him that made you feel good. That even when you disagreed with him, even when he was outrageous, which he was now and then, that, that he knew what he was doing. He knew this, this distinguished body. And you had a lot of powerful senators around, too, that, uh, that could have challenged him. This was the day of Kennedy and Symington, and George Aiken of Vermont and Press Bush of Connecticut. Uh, you had all of Dick Russell and Bob Kerr from Oklahoma. A formidable bunch. And they could have challenged him, but he, he, he handled it well and never, never did. These were his days when he drank, too. It's before he, he uh, cut off. I, now that, was a, that was an operation that uh, absolutely amazed me. <laughs> we would, I had, and my wife always told me she could tell the night that I'd been with LBJ because I was, I, was, I was quite tiddly by the time I got home. And there were some of those nights that were just great. I got wonderful stuff and couldn't remember it when I finally sat down at the typewriter. But he used to drink, and he he had these, he had these. Uh, apparently, he got his hands got cold with a regular glass. And Johnson was a gadget man. He just loved loved all these new things that came in. You know that's why he was the first man to use a helicopter in campaigning, a bullhorn down there. And so he discovered that there was the insulated glass. It was plastic glass with, uh, with two layers, like a thermos jug, but they were glasses. They, and they wouldn't get his hands cold. And I, I was kind of tickled by it. But then I began to understand what it was all about. Uh, that Johnson, would, uh, Johnson would come in at whatever drinking time it was, and uh, he'd hold out his hand. And I forget who he's personal valet or his personal assistant was there, but he, 
he, uh, you know, he, he, Johnson publicly said he drank bourbon. I suppose all Southern senators had to tell that was nonsense. Cutty Sark was what he drank. The doctor told him that after his heart attack. Johnson said, "You know, it's the three S's, you three S's." I said, "Really?" He said, "Scotch, sleep, and sunshine." <laughs> <laughs> this was his formula for <laughs> so anyway he'd ho he'd sit there and he'd be talking to me and he'd hold out his hand and the guy would spot it and he'd just have his hand out there and pretty soon he'd slap in one of a drink cutty sart and soda drink and Johnson might hold it for another five ten minutes I've seen him just hold it like that then he had a, as near as I could tell I haven't examined this with medical authority he had an epiglottis that he could control. He didn't have to swallow. He'd just drain the whole thing. Just open his mouth and the whole thing would go down without gulping or swallowing. Uh -huh. And he'd hold it out and the guy'd grab the glass and go back behind the screen. <laughs> and Johnson would talk a little bit and then his hand would go up. And this 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 procedure absolutely fascinated me. I'd never seen anything like it before in my life. As 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 we talked, and, I, and he, let me tell you, he went through a lot of them, but they were half strength. People talk about his drinking, they were half strength. I never saw Johnson lose control. I saw him when he probably shouldn't have drunk as much. I saw him kind of stunned, but uh, and particularly on the floor up there, I never saw him, uh, uh, what I would say, really drunk or really out of control or anything. I never saw it. So I'm, he, he was always in command, as near as I could, I could tell, but he, but he had this routine with the gunny circuit and, uh, and the soda that was, that was just hilarious. And, uh, uh, but there were great moments. Now, uh, Bob Cairo has opened, uh, opened his second book with one of those, and that was the 57 uh, Civil Rights Bill. And I thought that, I always felt that that was more important than people suggested. Uh, the 64 bill was the one that everybody come, uh, talks about. And I think probably in the long run it was, it was important. But I think internally in the Senate, the 57 bill was very important in which he convinced his Southern colleagues, Dick Russell and those people, to go along with him on this, or at least not to oppose it. And he got that done. And I always remember, it was near midnight, as I recall, when the bill was passed. And, and I, by then, I was, I was uh, somewhat familiar with Johnson. And I went up to the gallery to watch that. And that vo vo roll call vote, and Johnson again with these hand signals. and. As I recall, it was kind of a gray silver suit he had on, and uh, he had his Vixen Haler, and he had it all orchestrated. And the people came in when he when he gestured, and I, I, it was a magnificent sort of drama of American work by a, a skilled man. I, I just I loved the whole thing, and of course, I was down at the White House later on, and when he was president, and. Uh, and he wasn't on the floor then. I guess the bills passed were uh, probably uh, more significant then. But this was this was Johnson at work as a majority leader, and it was just marvelous work. Yeah, and I back there. Then he got, of course, he got mixed up in the campaign. What I didn't understand was that he was uh, that serious of a candidate till till later. Because Johnson kind of cloaked it and put it aside. He always used to tell me, I'd go in there and say, you can't, you running now, Mr. President, or Mr. Leader, you running? Or well, how are you going to handle it? Oh, you, no, no, no. He said, I, I would not begin to think about it until I'm sure that the American people want me. Well, I remember I, once I was on the, up there on the subway of the Senate, and uh, John Kennedy was going on the subway, and he said, on. So we sat together and he said, what are you learning? I said, well, I was just in with Johnson. He said, well, well, what's what's the word? Is he going to announce his candidates? I said, I said, Senator, he told me he wasn't going to do anything until he was sure the American people wanted him. Kennedy looked at me scornfully. He said, you, we've all decided long ago that the American people can't live without us. <laughs> I said, well, you're probably right. But Johnson kind of put it aside. He had the, he had the, the legislation to work it. But any, in any event, I, it, you know, it got, got pretty heated, and I spent a long time in it. You know, one of Johnson's monologues would go an hour, sometimes two. 
get off on this bill and that bill, and he'd tell old stories about FDR. Uh, I remember, if, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm ahead of myself here. We, we got in there, and then he, he, a little edge began to creep in his talk about John Kennedy, right up to the campaign, and that's that was that famous outburst. I, I think I've written about that, but a famous outburst where <laughs> he's talking about how old Joe Kennedy was a crook and should been should have been put in jail, and now his kid is going to run for president. This rickety little guy, you know, he's got yellow jaundice and his legs aren't any bigger than this. And <laughs> Rick. <laughs> rickety little guy. It just went on and on. And I'm sitting there. By then I was wise to it. I always, you know, you knew what to discard with Johnson. If you if you were a really good reporter and you've been around, you knew what to, with, to discard with him. You know, he, he was over the top. And and uh, this, this was just Johnson doing his bit. And I suppose it was wrong. I, it, our, our talks were always kind of background. I just had a sense of what you could use, what you couldn't, what you should use, what you shouldn't. If there was a question, I went to him, asked him, Are you, is this something we quote you on, and that sort of thing. But most of it was background. He was just telling me what his, his feelings were, and these moments uh, would flare up like with, with Kennedy, and then uh, I think it was that same one as he got to talking about that little, <laughs> little guy. I think he also threw in the phrase, you know, he's supposed to have venereal disease, and he'd got all these other things wrong with him. <laughs> and, uh, and I think it was then, and then he started to talk about old Joe. He told me this story. He said, uh, he said, you know, the old man fired him. Roosevelt fired him. He said, uh, he said you know, he's a crook. He should have been put in jail. He said, uh, he said, you know, I happened to be down there. I said, he said, I was, I was there. He said, you know, old man Roosevelt. Uh, uh, he said, you know, he was got awful lonely down there. He said, uh, you know, he crippled there. He had a stamp collection, but. He said, he came in, he said, I, was, I, I ran with Roosevelt, I ran, and he ought to, always had a fondness for me, uh, because I'd, I'd, I'd support him. Everybody else in 36 had run the other way. They thought Alf Lannan was going to do some, uh, make, it might beat him. And he said, I didn't, I stuck with Roosevelt, and I, that, his platform was my platform. So he said, Johnson used to call me down for lunch, and, uh, and uh, said, uh, this day I, I went down there and he said, I don't know, he said, we're in there and the poor old man's all alone. He said, you know, uh, his sons are out there screwing starlets and Eleanor's off with the niggers someplace. I, now, forgive me, but th those were his words. And uh, he said, here he is alone. He said, well, we're having lunch and talking about the hill. And he said, and the phone rings. I think he may have said Grace Tully came in. and said, Mr. President, Joe Kennedy just landed in New York. This was, these were in the tense years, 39, 40. Joe, Ambassador Kennedy, and he wants to talk to you. And uh, so he said, Roosevelt, they handed him the phone, he said, Roosevelt threw that wonderful head of his back and said, Joe, my old friend, so good to hear your voice, went on and on. Joe, hurry down here. I must talk to you. Can you get the plane down? We'll have dinner tonight. We'll have a couple of drinks and we'll have dinner and we'll talk about things. When he, when he put the phone down, Johnson said, I said something. Mr. President, I thought uh, he was in real trouble for what he said about the war. He said, Roosevelt looked at him and said, Lyndon, I'm going to fire the son of a bitch. <laughs> this is Johnson's story. How much of it's true? I don't know. But th th these sort of things, in these, in these monologues that would go on and on, all of these stories had kind of rolled out of, of his time with these people. And, uh, and it's just wonderful stuff. I, I have no doubt about it that you know, you had to take about 50% of them and then worry about the other 50%. How true, how true they was. But he did have a marvelous relationship. He told me another wonderful story about when he was a congressman. This goes clear back. 
and when he was trying to get the dams on the lower Colorado River. Now that's one of Johnson's great monuments, I think, that never have gotten enough credit as he got those dams on the lower Colorado River so there was water, there was power, and that was a wonderful thing. When I used to cover Johnson, when he was president, I'd rent a car and uh, drive down along those lakes and you know how that transformed that uh, part of the world. And, uh, and Johnson, it, it, you know, told a story about how he got the dams, it, true or not, I don't know. But he says, uh, said uh, he'd call up Abe Fortas, he knew Abe Fortas, or Paul Watson, I guess it was, and said, I need to see the president. I need to talk to him. We need to get some money. We got to get these projects going down there. And so he, he said, I'd go in there. He said, I remember one time I went in there and he said, I'd get 10 minutes. Paul Watson said, you got 10 minutes. He said, I'd, I'd walk up to the president's desk there. And he said, before I could say anything, the president said, Lennon. He said, I'd just been sitting here talking with Ambassador Bullitt. He's just back from Moscow. Why, he tells me the darndest stories. And he'd start to tell stories. And Johnson's there with these papers, you know, waiting. And he said then, and, and, and Ambassador says, those women, they work in the fields. They work on the railroads. So they've got arms as big as your legs. They've got more muscles. And, I think it is, and Johnson would describe a naked Russian woman to him. And he said about that time, Watson would grab him on the shoulder and said, time's up, Congressman, and out he would go. And so he said, I went to, uh, I went to Abe Fortas and I said, uh, Abe, how do, I, how, do I, how do I get this? And Abe looked at it and he said, oh, this is the dam. And he said, I tell you what, Lyndon, he said, Roosevelt thinks he's a big architect and he loves dams and buildings and that. So get some, get some pictures of dams and that. Get some photographs, some di drawings and that. So he said, I went down there. I went down there one time and I, he said, I had all this stuff under my arm. He said, same thing started to happen. He said, Lyndon, I've got a story to tell you or something like that. He said, I had these out and he said, about, about, about a minute into it, he could see Roosevelt was looking at said, Lennon, what do you got there? He said, well, Mr. President, we're trying to get these dams on the lower Colorado River. And of course, Lennon understood Roosevelt was besieged with requests. I mean, everybody wanted money then. And so he said, well, I've, I've just got it. So he said, come around here. He said, we spread up. And Roosevelt said, oh, look, here's a super reinforced concrete, whatever it was. Oh, that's, that's a nice design there. He said, what was it you wanted? <laughs> <laughs> what did you want? He said, well, I wanted appropriation. I wanted to get this going. He said, he, right there, he, he called Harold Ickes. And there was, a, there was a rule that you couldn't get these appropriations unless your population density was a certain level. And Johnson, down there along the uh, lower Colorado, they didn't have enough people to get the money. So he called up Harold Ickes and he said, uh, Harold, he said, uh, got Lennon Johnson in here. He needs a some dams down there on the lower Colorado where he said there's a lot of muffled conversation. And he, and he says, oh, you, 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 Harold, you say there aren't enough people? He, he said, John, and Roosevelt looked up at him and said, Harold, he said, if I know those cedar cutters down there, by the time you get those dams done, there'll be enough people. <laughs> and he said, I got, my, I got it, I got it through. And that started that whole thing. Johnson's story, again, how much is right, I don't know. But it was wonderful for the kid reporter like myself sitting there listening to how business was done and how, how these things uh, happened. It, it was just wonderful, and particularly from that New Deal time when th there was so much sentiment. And of course, he still had the, the people around him. I'd run into Abe Fortas all the time that uh, was there. and uh, and. Uh, uh, and uh, and then his private lawyers were around, old Leonard Marks and uh, and and the other Jim Rowe from the Roosevelt. A lot of the Roosevelt people were still around and still plugged into Johnson and those in in that majority in that majority uh, leader term. Now we come up to the campaign and uh, and they want I did the cover stories. I reported the cover stories on all of them. Symington, Humphrey, Humphrey was another one. Uh, Kennedy, uh, and then Johnson. And so I, I wrote, I remember I wrote a file for uh, New York and uh, they didn't like it. They said, oh, that's, this is enough. You've got to get some color in there. 
So I went up to them and said, well, I don't have enough. And John said, I'm going to the ranch. Come on down. So I said, well, I, I can't right now. But he said, Joy, come on down to the ranch. Spend the weekend. So this was in the spring of 60, I believe. So off I went <laughs> down to the ranch, another one of those wild times. Uh, but I, I saw him in the native habitat, I, and that was invaluable. First time I'd been down there and on the ranch. Then, of course, he took me all through the ranch and explained to me about uh, the family, told me the stories about this, whoever it was, his great-grandmother that had thwarted the Indians. She'd been alone, and they had a little trap door, and they pulled a rug over the gut down there, stuffed a diaper in the in the mouth of his grandfather, his father, I forget which, so they didn't cry when the Indians came in, and they didn't, and they escaped that way. A lot of wonderful old Texas stories. And of course, I was absolutely mesmerized. We, he took me on the tour around the county there, and, the, uh, and we went there, they were starting the LBJ Park, there was the LBJ Ranch House, there was the LBJ Birthplace, <laughs> there was the LBJ Boyhood Home, there was the L LBJ School, there was the LBJ Lake, there was the LBJ REA. <laughs> <laughs> and I got tickled about it. And a wrong move, I said something about it. I said, aren't they going to name the school?